Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the invention of the iPhone. And in many ways, the iPhone is the culmination of the combination of the three great inventions we've been talking about that created the digital revolution. The microchip, the internet, and the computer. And when it was launched in January 2007, it just showed the promise of what the digital revolution could be. It begins because Steve Jobs, uh, a few years earlier, had created the iPod. Now, he was a great entrepreneur driven mainly by his passions. Up until then, Apple had mainly been doing computers. But Steve Jobs loved music. As I told you way back when, when he and Wozniak first became friends in high school, they went to try to score bootleg tapes of Bob Dylan concerts and had wonderful collections of the Beatles records. And what Steve Jobs wanted was something simple, a thousand songs in his pocket. He didn't want one of those big old Sony Walkman. And so he invents the iPod out of passion, but it becomes like a lot of products invented out of passion, a great commercial success as well. So by 2005, iPod sales are $20 million a year for Apple, which is four times what they had been the year before. They grow, they're growing at four times each year. And it was 45% of the revenue of Apple. Plus it really helped Apple because it burnished Apple's image as being the really hip computer company. So by buying iPods, people decide, okay, I'm gonna buy a Mac as well. I'm gonna define myself as an Apple person. But Steve Jobs was upset, he was worried even though he was so successful, or perhaps because he was so successful, he was losing sleep. He kept saying, what could kill us? What could destroy us? And he realized that if the brain dead people who made cell phones, as he put it, figured out you could put music on the cell phones, that would destroy the iPod business. So he goes back to his team at Apple and he says, we are going to create a phone that has music on as well. And they said, well, that'll cannibalize the iPod business if we do that. And he says, wonderful thing, if you're an entrepreneur, remember this, you know, if we don't cannibalize ourselves, somebody else is gonna eat us. So he decides that he's gonna create a product that'll actually hurt the iPod, but it'll prevent, it'll merge together the iPod and a phone, and it'll prevent others from getting into the business. At first, they decided, well, let's just try to use the user interface for the iPod and see if we can make it work for an iPod and a telephone. In other words, that click wheel that you have on the iPod, figure out a way that it can dial a number, how you can make it point to a number on the screen and click on it. And also, I guess, how you enter letters so that you can put people in your address book. Once again, we're talking about user interfaces being really important. In other words, how do we connect with our computers? And it was not totally intuitive. It was not a great interface to have to use a scroll wheel to enter letters or you know, maybe dial a phone. So Steve Jobs at the time is also having Apple work on a tablet computer. And here's some of the patent applications for it from early 2006, this is before uh, the iPhone gets launched, and the way the tablet computer was going to work, and by the way, it's why the way the iPad, which came out later, does work, is it had a touch screen. You could just touch the screen and enter things, like you could, if there's a keyboard, you touch the screen and enter letters. If you want to dial something, if you want to uh, click on a contact, if you want to do anything, you could do it with touch. In fact, it was multi-touch. You could use more than one finger. You could expand the screen. You could swipe the screen. All of these were patents that Apple had developed in 2004, 2005, 2006 for what would have been a tablet. And Steve says, no, we'll do the tablet later. The phone is more important. And he shows his great design director, Johnny Ive, the idea of multi-touch. And he shows it to Tony Fidel, who had made the iPod. And said, instead of a scroll wheel, maybe we should make the phone have multi-touch. Now, when I talked to Johnny Ive, he had a different and probably better memory of it. 
which is that Johnny Ive had already been working on his own in his design studio at Apple. He was a design guru on multi-touch and hadn't fully briefed Steve on it. But either way, they come up with the idea that they're gonna try two types of possible phones. One called P1, which uses the track wheel, and the other that uses multi-touch, like the phones we have today. And eventually they say, hey, this multi-touch thing is so much cooler than trying to use a track wheel. Let's do it. I remember sitting at Steve Jobs' house once. He, as I said, he loved music and the Beatles. And he had gotten all the tapes of all the sessions of the Beatles trying to perfect um, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And how John Lennon and McCartney, they'd play it and then they'd fiddle with it and play it again, continually perfecting it. And he said it was an act of creativity showing that real creativity comes from perfecting things, not just a light bulb moment. And he said that he had a Sergeant Pepper's period when he was working on the iPhone. Every day he'd spend hours in the design studio of Johnny Ive on the Apple campus behind locked doors, looking at the various ways they could improve the user interface and make it more intuitive. And he, of course, patents it all. And he comes up with the notion of little, uh, you know, app sort of buttons you'll put on the screen. So it's not like a regular computer that's using that Xerox Park graphical user interface of files and folders exactly. It's using little buttons and apps. More importantly, he hated on off switches. He kept saying, what happens if I take my phone and put it in my pocket and it doesn't, and I don't turn it off. Is that a problem? And he said, he figures out how to do swipe to unlock so that you never really have to turn it on and off. It'll go off by itself at a certain point. And when you open it, you just swipe it to open. There are all sorts of other things he does, like what happens when you take it and you put it to your ear? Won't your ear touch one of the apps and make it go up? And so he had a sensor that was put into the phone so that if it got near an ear or something like that, the multi-touch would turn off and it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't inadvertently open things up. They also tried to push him on the notion of maybe doing a physical keyboard. I'm old enough to remember, in fact, I think I have it here in my desk. Yeah, you know, Blackberries. I had one of the original Blackberries and it's because we liked physical keyboards. Uh, some people wanted a stylus, others wanted a keyboard. Uh, stylus, no. Uh, Steve Jobs says, you're born with 10 of those, your fingers. We don't need to include one. And as for a physical keyboard, he said, that will detract, as you can see, as it did on all other phones that have it, from, from the beauty of the screen and the screen being dominant. And so he said, we'll just have a software that does the keyboard on the screen itself. It'll pop up when you need it and disappear when you don't. We won't have a physical keyboard. I'm so old fashioned enough that I hope that a Blackberry or somebody comes back with physical keyboards. I tend to like them, but 99% of the world doesn't want physical keyboards. And finally, he decided that the design should have the glass go all the way to the end of the phone. It should be a beautiful piece of glass. And he wanted the type of glass that wouldn't scratch, it wouldn't break. And all the glass that was being used on phones, he thought was crappy, you know, it came from China or whatever. So he calls up Corning and he says, okay, I want you to make for me a glass that's indestructible and won't scratch. And uh, he meets with Wendell Weeks, the head of uh, Corning, and they go over what they're going to, you know, what Steve Jobs wants. And Steve finally says, yeah, that's what I want. Because Wendell Week said, we had come up with a formula known as Gorilla Glass, but we had never made it before. But Gorilla Glass would be tough enough to do that. And he said, well, I want it. And Steve said, and I want it by July because we're going to ship this phone, you know, by the fall. And Wendell Week said, there's no way we can have it done by July. We just, you know, we've never made it before. Steve, as I mentioned in one of my earlier lectures, had learned from his guru in India to stare at people without blinking. And he'd say to Wozniak, or he'd say to people on the Apple team, don't be afraid, you can do it. He does that to Wendell Weeks, the CEO of Corning. When Wendell Weeks says, we can't have it done, you know, by the end of the summer, he says, 
don't be afraid, you can do it. Wendell Weeks told me the story, said it's amazing. It was like 30 years after he had done it to Waz. He just stared at me without blinking. And Weeks said, I know how to make glass, you don't. And Jobs just kept, he kept saying, don't be afraid, you can do it. So after the meeting, Wendell Weeks called a plant manager that Corning had in Harrodsburg, Kentucky. They were making flat screen TVs. And he told the plant manager, I want you to switch over and start making Gorilla Glass. Plant manager said, fine, sir. We'll do it in about a month or so when we get the equipment. And we, he said, no, I want you to do it tomorrow. And the plant manager said, well, we don't necessarily have a... And Wendell Week said, I just kept telling him over the phone, don't be afraid, you can do it. The upshot is that every piece of glass on every iPhone that year when it was launched and ever since then has been made by Corning Glass using uh, Gorilla Glass, their new formula. In January 2007, Steve steps on stage at the Macworld Conference in San Francisco and introduces the iPhone. Now, you have to do this for me. You have to go online, go to YouTube, and just search iPhone Launch 2007. And there are many, many copies of it. Find a five or six minute clip just of that part where Steve announces the iPhone. It is the greatest product launch ever. And he starts by saying every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. He said he had done it with the Macintosh. He had done it with the iPod. And now he says, today, we are introducing three revolutionary products of this class. Three products that are going to be revolutionary the way the iPod and the Mac was. He said, the first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. Everybody applauded. Everybody wanted the widescreen iPod. He said, the second is a revolutionary mobile phone. People said, oh, great, all mobile phones suck. This is going to be wonderful. Huge applause in the audience. And finally, he said, and the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. And then he repeated it, each one of the things he was going to do. And finally, he said, are you getting it? These aren't three separate devices. This is one device. And we're calling it iPhone. You got to watch it. Go watch it on YouTube right after this. The cool thing about it was that it involved something we've been talking about all semester, which is a user interface. Instead of having machines that operate off on their own, the important thing is finding ways to connect humans to machines. And that means a user interface that's simple and intuitive. On his screens, on the launch, uh, when he's on stage, he talks about different ways of doing revolutionary user interfaces. He talks about the mouse. Remember Doug Engelbart does that in his mother of all demos and Xerox Park did it. And finally, Apple does the mouse. It's a good way to connect to your computer. Use the mouse like I'm doing. Then there was the click wheel for the iPod and now there was multi-touch. It's very interesting uh, how he realized that the main thing about the phone was that it had a great, easy user interface. Of course, it had many other things. It was a combination of being mobile, being internet, being uh, driven by microchips, about everything in the digital revolution. Also, at the end of the presentation, he put up those street signs I've showed you before. The street sign showing the, the intersection between the liberal arts and technology. He said, that's where we stand. And of course, that's what this iPhone was all about. It wasn't just about engineering. It was about connecting the humanities, the beauty of the humanities, the, the ability of the humanities to touch our soul the way it did with the iPod when it gave us a thousand songs. And then he talked about revolutionary user interfaces. And of course, it makes you think. What's the next one besides multi-touch? How are we going to really connect in a totally intuitive way with our phones and our computers? 
Steve Jobs died a few years later, but before he did, he and I talked about what would be the next revolutionary user interface. Think about it for a second. Think about what it might be. Well, you actually have it now. It wasn't available back then, but there was what Steve Jobs was talking about at the very end. He's saying, maybe I can just do a user interface that's pure voice. Maybe that's the next way. That's the way we talk to one another. Maybe that's the way humans and machines should interface. And so we have the culmination with the iPhone of the process of connecting the microchip and the computer and the internet and the process of connecting humans to machines. Thanks.